that's right, my friends. I'm Beto Gudiño. Welcome to another episode of Christian Podcast. Come. I'm so happy you guys are here with me and today I have a guest. He's got a book that I'm holding here in my hands. It's so good. It's called Life Lessons from the Little Red Wagon and it has a picture of the Little Red Wagon that I'm sure the entire world is familiar with and I mean, I even had one of those even though I grew up in Mexico and it wasn't until I came to the United States that I was able to get a hold of one of these. So it's super exciting conversation we're going to have today with Ron Simon. So let's welcome Ron to the show. Ron, how are you doing? Welcome to the hey, show. Hey, Beto, great. And man, what interesting and wonderful lead-in music. I like that. That's very good. That's a, that's a first for me. So I loved it. Wow. Awesome. Well, exciting. And I mean, the first question before we go to our first emoji is going to be this. When you hear my name, what does it stir in you? I mean, Beto. Oh, Beto, I, are you really going to lead off with that question? <laughs> well, well, people can read the book and they will find a little bit about how my life was kind of generally touched by Beto O'Rourke, who, uh, Beto Francis O'Rourke, who, uh, you know, ran for U.S. Senate, ran for governor as well in Texas, uh, unsuccessfully, but ran and was a uh, quite a popular figure, actually, especially with the uh, people that well, I would consider the millennial and the uh, Z generation and what have you. Uh, so, uh, yes, I uh, his popularity uh, on the Democrat Party actually played a big part in costing me an election. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, God works uh, through defeat as well as victory. Oof, I like that. Okay, so I mean, that maybe will even kick us off with our first emoji of the day. So we're going to the belief o meter to find what the emoji is. So the belief o meter is running and it's the inspired emoji. Inspired emoji. Okay, so I mean, I love what you just said that even in the failure, there's there's hope, right? So, I mean, is that related to why you're feeling inspired today or what's the idea behind Inspired Emoji? Well, the Inspired Emoji for me is something that I want to strive to always be. And uh, sometimes we have to look for inspiration different ways. It, and a lot of times when it's not there, you know, I, I talk about this, of course, in the book on, we, talk, we brought up Beto earlier and it was a bitter defeat. Uh, I had been reelected. Uh, I'd been elected once, reelected two other times, and you know I was just cruising along, and uh, actually passed a bill that probably would have gotten me reelected. But we delayed the implementation of the bill for another two years to help out some other people, and it ended up costing me. Uh, so, but I found after that, Beto, that there was a lot of inspiration. I need. I learned a little bit more about myself. And, uh, you know, God brought us, has brought us a bunch of great victories since that time. And uh, we learned the same thing with my son, Daniel, who's on the autism spectrum. We have to look for in inspiration in different ways uh, when we have something in front of us that might seem more like a burden than a blessing. And but some in all of these burdens, OK, there are blessings if we really want to look for them. And that that's inspiring to me. Wow, that is fire right there. I love it. I love to start with inspiration. And one of the ideas that inspire me about reading this book, it's actually I mean, I'm an immigrant. I come from Mexico. I'll maybe I'll, I'll go into a little bit of the details, even though I've, I've shared this on my show a bunch of times. Uh, but anyways, I'll go a little bit to, on those details in a little bit, because uh, the little red wagon. I mean, tell me a little bit about that story, because it was a, a Italian immigrant that right. kind of like started this. Right. So I resonate so much with that. And that inspires me so much, knowing that people from different countries can come to America and dream ambition yeah. and then everybody everybody in their lifetime will probably be you no know, resonate with a little red wagon so tell us that well, story real quick well antonio pasin p-a-s-i-n was born in venice italy and he uh he immigrated to the u.s in 1914 uh, into ellis island which a lot of people from europe uh, immigrated to back then and uh 
began working uh, just in the uh, industrial areas and came up with this idea of a wagon and being able to, because they would cart, at the time they would, you know, a lot of things were just sold on the street and, and young people would cart produce and other things around. But he came up with this idea of the radio flyer is what he named it, right? Because it, radio was pretty new back then, and that was something that was popular. And so he named his little red wagon the radio flyer. And me, like you, you mentioned earlier, and like millions of people across the world, have had one of those as a toy. They're, first of all, they're virtually indestructible. At least they were when they were made when I was younger. And they provide so many hours of just simple fun. But as we grow up and as I began to look back on it, Beto, it really was a metaphor for life. And uh, that's how I got the idea of utilizing that symbol uh, to talk about different parts of my life and really different parts of the, of people's lives. I think everybody lives. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting that you can I mean, you tell your story in the book and you say how you grew up, you know, in basically like a rural town, small town. Mm -hmm. and in a sense, you, you talk about this idea that around Simons, it's it's just somebody with maybe aspirations. And it's 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 basically anyone in this world. Right. And I so relate to that because sometimes as immigrants, we can feel like, man, it's tough. Like you were saying, you know, there's a burden maybe we're carrying uh, for mm -hmm. some of us. It's it's you know, missing the people that we left behind, things like yeah. that. Uh, so there's always something that that we carry. Right. And that's, that's the idea mm -hmm. of having a red wagon, because sometimes you're in the wagon. Sometimes you're pulling stuff, no sometimes somebody's pulling you. And this idea that that when when we come to America, we feel like maybe the nobodies. Maybe even like you even say in your book, the Ron Simons. And where what was the motivator for you to to find aspirations to say, yeah. you know, even though I grew up in America, because I, I see that even with Americans, right? People who live in yeah. America, we're like, man, you have it all. You have you have yeah. papers, you can travel, you can work, you have it all in your hands. What's going on? Why don't you yeah. aspire for things? What, what and, you, and, and what, you know, sometimes it and sometimes it's worse. For people that because they do have it all and they haven't had to fight for what you and others have had to fight for. And so uh, it, it's even more frustrating. But I, I do believe that for those of us that were fortunate enough to be born here, we weren't all born with a silver spoon in our mouth, for sure. My mm -hmm. mom and dad were public school teachers uh, in a very rural, low income area we would probably be considered lower middle class. And I was a middle child, right? So middle children have their own issues because uh, they're not the oldest, so they don't get that attention. They're not the baby, so they don't get that attention. So they're constantly, and I see it in my own uh, uh, grandkids, but the middle children of my of our grandkids is like this a lot. And so, so I, for whatever reason, Beto, and I, you know, I think that, you know, I'm a person of faith as you are. And I think God inspired this and in that for whatever reason, from when I was a little guy, I saw that my family struggled financially the entire time. Um, it, it was just always a struggle to, to feed six miles, right? Mom and dad and four kids. And so I was, it was always motivated to get out of that. I didn't have any idea how to get out of it, but I was very motivated to get out of that by whatever means that I could, hopefully they would be legal, but whatever at the time I didn't, you know, I just wanted to get out of it. Mm. Wow. That's so good. And I love that you say even like legal terms. Cause I think you think in the positions you're in, right. I mean, you're, you, you were in public service, uh, successful business. And I can only imagine the people you meet in those atmospheres and arenas. I was just watching the movie. I mean, it's an old movie, but it's the movie about Steve Jobs, right? And how he, he kind of like, in a sense, lost his soul, but he had a focus, you know? So he gave us what he wanted ultimately. And right now I'm actually talking to you through one of, one of his consequential inventions, right? I mean, Apple mm -hmm. Computer. So, right. I mean, do you think people can lose their souls in this in this aspiration for more? What's your experience? What have yeah. you witnessed? 
Yeah, I think that's a very good point, and it's something that we need to make sure that we're always testing ourselves against. And people, I think people can lose their way. Let me put it that way. Okay, they can lose their way. And I've been guilty of this as well as we get so hyper focused on a uh, what I call a temporal item, whether that's money or position or power, that we our soul begins to take a back seat to our desire. And really w- what that causes us to do generally is to make some poor choices. You know, for some people, that's a choice that crosses a line that might cost them their family, might cost them their freedom. For others, and for most of us, it does. it's not that drastic, but what it does is it creates scar tissue in relationships that we have that we said were important to us, but because of our singular focus on some temporal aspiration, those relationships get scarred. And that is something that we then have to, first of all, realize it and then figure out how do we repair that. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes you repair it, but it's never 100% of what it should be. So what I wanted to do in this book, one of the things is, is to, first of all, like you said it, I'm just every common person, right? I mean, there there are uh, not very many Tiger Woods in the world that have the talent that he does or or actors or actresses or any of those types of stuff. There's a lot of me, right? I'm just an average person, but I really believe that people that are average people can make very significant impacts on the world around them and beyond if they will just do the next right thing, take the next uncomfortable step, make sure they have the right mentors, all those types of things. Wow, that is so good. So taking the next uncomfortable step is not easy. And particularly, like you said, like here in America, um, this is, this is, I mean, what you're saying, right? Like we got to check ourselves and see where we're at in our relationships. And if we maybe our hyper focus is, is pulling us away from for maybe the relationships that matter. So I, I feel like I resonate so much with that because I think that's almost like I would say the warning sign for, for people that come to America with those dreams, right? Like uh, yeah. America is great and you can attain the dream, but at what cost? So, I mean, I love that you said that, but also what are some of those maybe uncomfortable steps we need to take? One, to wake up to to our reality that relationships are the ones I mean, our closest relationships really and and the relationships that matter, like never lose those. Like what is uh what can help people wake up when they're lost in their when they're hyper focused, when they're maybe greedy even? Like what are you what have you witnessed that can help people? Yeah. Well wake it's up yeah, again? it's you it's usually talk about a couple of things here. It's usually something that in a normal day to day thing would be uh pretty small, right? Mm. Uh, Maybe it's, and and for me, a lot of times it was, as I've mentioned, our son, Daniel, who's an adult now that is on the autism spectrum. A lot of times it was something in his very uh, black and white brain on how he looked at the world, just something very succinct that he might say, right? That would kind of set me back and say, oh, you know what? I, I, I need to be paying better attention to this or that. And mm-hmm. so not everybody has a Daniel in their life, but they do have people and things around them. Maybe it's a book they're reading. Maybe it's maybe it's their spouse. Maybe it's their child. A lot of times uh, the spouse will be saying the same thing that we need to hear, but it'll take our child to say it in a different way to really have an impact on us. Right. I'll, I'll never, I'll never forget that, uh, when uh, when I was given a talk one time, and I, the talk was about being a participant or a crusader, okay? Hmm. And a participant in life is somebody that just kind of goes along, and maybe they'll clap for everybody else, but they really don't get in the battle themselves, right? And Daniel was about 16 at the time, and he was uh, at that event that I was speaking at uh, backstage And when I came off stage, he said, dad, I want to be a crusader. And it's emotional for me. So I apologize for that. But 
the reason that affected me, Beto, was because I had always put him in the participant category because of his disability. Mm. And so that just hit me that, you know what, Ron, you don't get to decide who crusaders are. And so we don't get to decide what other people might achieve or want in life. It's our job to get out of our comfort zone and maybe travel it with him or help them take that help them take that next step, whether that's whether that's learning, you know, how to talk to somebody on the phone or whether that's taking a risk financially. What it, we usually know what the uncomfortable step needs to be, Beto. But sometimes we need the encouragement to take it. And you'll never you'll never reap the blessings of that step unless you're willing to take the risk that the step might also cause some pain. Wow. The phenomenal right there. And you said in page 22, you can't plan your life banking on luck. And that resonated so much with me. And and I think it's 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 what you're saying, right? It takes an uncomfortable step. And I relate to that, you know, as an immigrant, and I want to kind of like right. call people that are listening, you know, and if you relate with me, maybe because I'm Latino, uh, you know, people that are listening and they're Latinos, you know, and they're thinking like, what's my next uncomfortable step, you know? And uh, I mean, before I even started Christian podcasts, I used to be in construction, right? Because you come to America and you kind of like find the jobs that are available. And it's something I, I never thought I was going to do. Like in Mexico, <laughs> when I lived there, like I never grabbed a hammer. I never, you know, poked a nail. I never, you know, put a screwdriver gun. Like yeah. I never used any of those because that was just like so far off. Then I come to America and learn all these skills, right? But there came a time when, uh, you no, know, the opportunity presented to me to work at the church and things like that. And, and I remember like putting my tools aside and having a moment, like even like looking at my tools. And I said, as much as these tools have been, uh, helpful in my life, you know, a source of income of sorts and things like that. I said, this is the moment it, it was almost like burning the ships. It was like, I got to get rid of my tools. I started giving some away to friends that mm. were construction. Yeah. I started, you know, mm -hmm. just maybe selling some off, but I felt like it, there was a defining moment in my life when I said, I got to move on to the next step. And I love in your book, you have even like a very specific date when you were in a successful business and if you want to learn more of the story, if you're listening, you want to learn more of the story of how you got to that success. Cause I think we're, we're just going to like, you know, uh, jump to the next question. But, um, uh, you talk about a decisive moment when you said it's time to leave my job and you even like put the date on the screen of your computer and it was yeah. like 1998, December right. 31st. So that's tell right. me about that. Cause I think that's, uh, that's maybe one of the uncomfortable steps, but what made you decide, like, uh, uh, and maybe that visual reminder, like, what made you decide, like, I got to look at this date and by December 31st, move on to the next chapter, maybe even without knowing what the next chapter was going to yeah. be. And I, and I surely didn't. It was so. So what happened? Lee, my wife and I, Lisa, who we've now been married 43 years. Uh, we got married very young, so don't, don't I'm not I'm not 100 years old. Okay, so uh, I was 19 and she was 20, and we had our first child, Justin, uh, pretty early, about a year and a half into our marriage, and so I had spent a lot of effort on my career, right? I mean, that had been my probably my primary focus, maybe to the detriment, I'm sure it was in some cases of family and other things, uh, but I got to the point. And it just hit me one day when when my oldest was about he was probably in the 10th grade or so year 10 of, of high school. And I could, for whatever reason, it just kind of hit me that he is going to be leaving the nest pretty soon before I could, you know, probably blink my eye. He would be off to college and then whoever who knows what would happen after that. And so. And I had put a lot of effort in building our business, and I, had, I was a little bit getting to the burnt out stage because I had put so much time and effort into that. And so, for whatever reason, it just you know I don't the Lord speaking to me, uh, you know through praying about it and what have you that okay I've got to make a decision and it's not going to be comfortable at all. All right. In fact, I had a lot of my friends tell me I was crazy for doing it, but probably I, I probably did leave money on the table. I know I did. 
But I wanted to be able to spend some real quality time with Justin before he went to college. And so 123198 was the middle of his 11th year in high school, so a junior in high school. And that would give me, he was a golfer, so the spring semester was coming up. So that would give me time to go to his golf uh, tournaments and practices and caddy for him if he wanted me to. And then his entire senior year, I could do that as well. So I just made a decision that I was going to focus my attention on getting to the point where I could do that. And uh, it all worked out where I was able to do that. Uh, I mean, we weren't, you know, super well off financially, but we did had put enough back to where um, I knew that for the next couple of years, I didn't have to spend a lot of time thinking about that. And I'll tell you, uh, it may have cost me millions of dollars, but I would not trade those 18 months for anything anything in my life. we The bond that we developed and still enjoy today was developed in the quality time that I was able to spend with him as a teenager and moving into young adulthood. Wow. And that really speaks of of legacy, right? And uh, I mean, here at our church, we have been talking about legacy for about maybe five months or so. Mm -hmm. But even as I think of America as I think of immigrants coming here, even as I think of the little red wagon and this man from Italy, like leaving a legacy, right, for people. Uh, and, like you made that decision in order that you would have such a connection with your kids. And I mean, I mean, Ali Betstucky, right? Like we, we know she's a podcaster. She's one of the yeah. most popular ones out there. And I can't help but think that like steps that you take, like you took with Justin and maybe similarly with you know, your daughter and your other son, where were steps that really impacted them to the point where it's, it's awesome to see where they're at now. Right. And sometimes right. we have uh, maybe even as, like I said, like as immigrants, we're like, Oh, this is, this is what I want to do for me. And I want to attain maybe the dream here in America. But I think there's, I resonate with that so much. Like when, when we focus on maybe our family, maybe on our kids, maybe mm -hmm. you see them as the, the legacy, the next generation. And, and I think that's so beautiful because not only are you talking about your own family, but then the opportunity came for you to become a public servant. And I think you, you showcase that by what you just explained right now. You became a servant to your own son, right? And, and I think, in, yeah. I mean, I'm just saying like in God's view that, that, pre that prepare you for some of the next steps, like, okay, if you can be a public servant in a sense to your own family, your own kids, no, I think you, you have the character to be a public servant for, for the rest of maybe the yeah. state of that's Texas. A good, right? that, that's a good, that's a good point. You know, and when people, when they read the book uh, or listen to the book on audible, if that's what they want to do, the, and I'm not saying this happens, it will happen exactly like this for them, but the willingness to take that uncomfortable step at that point in time, uncomfortable. It, it wasn't uncomfortable emotionally. It was uncomfortable financially, which affects how we think emotionally. The blessing that came with Justin individually. And like you said, I think the rest of my family noticed that, but even beyond that, the opportunities, because I really did not know what we would do financially for the long term, whether we would just, you know, cut our lifestyle way back and, you know, live off of what we had, or I just didn't know, but the opportunities that came after that, which I never could have imagined and never could have come up with on my own uh, were just phenomenal. And one of those later on uh, was the ability, like you said, to, I would, to, it was, see, the, when I started, when I got into public service, I, have, so I had to make another decision because I'd gotten back into business after Justin went to college. When I got into public service, which in Texas doesn't pay, none like California where they make six-figure incomes in Texas, a, tech, a, a legislator makes $600 a month, so it doesn't pay anything. Oh. I had to make another decision to leave a business world to get into that. But that decision was easy because I had done it before, and I, I had an idea of how, how, uh, how it could go and how it would go and how I would feel about that. So 
that that was it was really a preparation i think wow yeah so good okay so let's talk a little bit about that that um going from the business world into the <laughs> the politics world what was that like for you and like we said you know at the beginning i just kind of like tease you with what what do you think of when you hear the name Beto? And you talk yeah. about failure, right? Like almost like not not necessarily running against him because you were in a different um, field. <laughs> I'm just yeah, using my right. word. Uh, but uh, but in a sense, like his trickle down effect yeah. affected you, right? So no question. Yeah. A little bit about that. It's so interesting to me. Like politics in America, um, is is there really willingness to to work together like well this is yeah this is a great question i'm glad you asked especially given your background as well one of the things and i'm a little bit embarrassed by this beta i will tell you but one of the things that i learned is uh that actually there are many things that democrats and republicans agree on all right But what I've learned even more is that the person on the other side of the aisle, so to speak, that may have a different view on some of the public policies that we discuss is a person that arrived on the scene just like I did. They cared about their community. They have a family. They have a business. They, and what I, the way I learned this, Beto, was something that I still think is pretty unique. And, and again, I believe that the Lord led me to do this, is that when I got elected and got down to Austin, which is our state capital, I told my staff, I want you to set up a meeting with every single other legislator down there, all right? And the types of representatives, that's 149 other representatives. And in the Senate, that's 30. So I had 179 meetings. It took me 70 days to get them all done. And they're meetings that didn't have any agenda. It was simply a meeting to get to know the person. And what I found out, especially when I went to meet with the people that were representatives from the Rio Grande Valley, and these were all of Latino background, And most of them were Democrats. That's just the way they had grown up. Now, most of them were as conservative as I was, right? Wow. Uh, but that's the way they grew up. And what I learned, though, is I met with this young man who was in the same, we came in at the same time, named Terry Canales. Terry Canales's family had been in Texas since the 1500s. Okay, it came over from Spain like a lot of the people did because it was a Spanish colony at the time. And what I what hit me in the middle of my meeting with Terry was that, you know what, this guy is more Texan than I, my family or I will ever be. And just because we don't agree 100 on everything, I need to pay attention to what he says and I need to you know, take a little bit off of myself, you know, and realize this person is has got actually much more claim on all of what's related to Texas than I do. And that was just very eye-opening for me and allowed me also just to build relationships with all these people, Beto. And that was really important. That's And that's why I know that the majority of the things we discussed in the legislature, uh, we could come to agreement on. There were always the social things sometimes and a few tax related, but many of the things we actually had good agreement on. And even, and we went out to dinner with each other and those like that. And those are important. That doesn't mean we're dealing with the enemy. It means we're building relationships and compromise only comes through relationships and the ability to see the other side of the equation. Well, that's so fire right there. I love that. And I mean, there's, there's so many takeaways right there. Uh, but I think so. Again, I mean, just kind of like here in the in this like immigration and, you know, I'm from Guadalajara, Mexico. I've uh, like I just saw a movie. It's called The Sound of Freedom. Yeah, and, I haven't seen it, but I want to go see it. I oh, just yeah, uh, go uh, see Allie it. Beth just had the uh, the. Uh, Agent. That, yeah, yeah. He, she was just on his podcast yesterday, so I listened wow. to that. It was good. Oh, so good. I mean, Tim Ballard, and and I mean, he was in Homeland Security, right? Right. So, technically, I mean, we call it La Migra, <laughs> right? So yeah. I mean, so so impactful. But what I wanted to get at is that the producer of the movie, 
is Eduardo Verastegui, a, a Mexican actor, right? And he said, I mean, there, there's this beautiful interview somewhere on YouTube or the internet somewhere where there's the, 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 the actor, Jim Caviezel, and Eduardo Verastegui, and they're like, hey, here you have a Mexican who loves Mexico, who came to America, opportunities open, I'm so grateful for America, and here you have an American actor, I mean, the American actor, right, Jim Caviezel, mm -hmm. and it's like, but what I learned is that uh, let's work together, let's, let's, right. I mean, you're going to watch the movie, and people are reacting to this movie, and it's powerful, it's powerful, but I feel like there's so much power in understanding uh, the people we might even disagree with maybe Absolutely. like you said we might have more in common than than we than we realize right, right? And, and i think this movie uh, specifically the people behind it i'm like okay if they partnered together and they can produce mm -hmm. something so powerful what would happen if we start doing the same like you just did with with mr canales right so right. i mean that is so powerful what would you say is the maybe your dream as a as a person who's who's been in business in public service your dream to see as an american even as it relates specifically right now i'm just going to say with with the relationship with mexico right and in texas where it's it's a border um uh, state right so just like yeah. here in california like what is your dream what would be your your vision for that right well i think i think it's twofold okay uh for that particular things i've thought a lot about this i was on the uh we had a Homeland Security Committee that I served on. And so I spent some time on the border. I spent some time uh, down there uh, for seeing immigrants as they were being processed. I spent some time seeing a, uh, a, a, a this six foot four border security guy carrying around this little baby. And we at my wife and I asked him, well, what's the story? She says, well, this baby was was carried across by someone who claimed to be the baby's father and actually had no relation to him, didn't know him. And so it was probably some type of smuggling incident and your heart just breaks. And so to, to solve, to solve problems like that, it can't start from the bottom up. The bottom up can create the uh, noise and the emotion, but the change has to start at the top. And so the leaders of the two countries, as far as that's concerned, have to come together on a way that is that works for both countries. Like I said earlier, if, you, if you're doing a deal, you need to be able to have both sides walk away and say, you know what, this really wasn't perfect for me, but it's, it's a good deal. If one side says, man, we took it to them, that doesn't work, all right? And so in this scenario, the, the reason people from Mexico and Central America come to the U.S. is they see that as a land of greater financial opportunity and potentially security as well for some of them, right? Because they do have real issues with that. And so, and we like that, actually. That's a plus. In fact, we need more, honestly. And But in order for it to happen in a way that's acceptable to uh, people that live here uh, in effect, whether they were born here, they came here through the process where they're legally here or documented here, however you want to call it, uh, we have to change the system on our side, okay? On our side, we have to change the system that allows people that want the opportunity, that aren't going to be bringing anything negative to us, to have that opportunity in a way that's relatively easy for them to obtain it. And on the other side, what Mexico has to do is they have to agree to that and they have to help us not allow the flood of what's going on right now. Probably 80 percent of those people should be here and we should have a process for them to be here properly. The 20 percent, though, that get through that cause challenges or it's the cart. My son's a. a, a a federal prosecutor in San Antonio. So he deals with a lot of the cartel scenario, right? Oh. And so the 20% that gets through doing that or whatever the percentage is, that's what we really have to come together. And that's where I think the 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 government of Mexico can help us the most. Mm, that's so good. <laughs> and that's even a business tip that I got from your book. And and 
this is more political, but it applies when you say, you know, kind of like be careful who's your competitor because in the future they might be you might be partners, right? That's so exactly like right. That's, yes. It That's applies true. to this arena too, you know, like I mean Mexico and the US have always been in relationship and yeah. And I think we should consider each other partners, right? In that sense. No question so, about it. Wow. So good. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna finish with uh I have two ideas, but I'm only going to pick one because I feel like the, the topic we've been talking about is okay. Which emoji one are you picking? <laughs> I, <laughs> I think I'm I'm going to the skeptical emoji for myself. Oh, okay. Because I have a question, okay, and this is this is just far fetched, but uh, I love how in the book you say. I mean, you're talking to people, and you're like, you guys are doing pretty well off with money. We want a piece of that, you know, like. <laughs> you want to be rich too yeah and in a sense i feel like uh i mean this is a long story i'm gonna like summarize it in like five seconds you know i'm still waiting for my papers i'm still in a process mm -hmm. and i thought wow ron is there anything you can do to help me like speed that up and i'll leave it <laughs> at that i have no idea but i'm like lord knows is there anything you can do to help me speed up my immigration process well, you never know. You never know. It's all it's generally not always. OK, because it is a you know, there is a backlog, but it's it is generally about people that, you know, and it, you never know until you try. You know, it's just an uncomfortable step that you take. Yeah, we may get rejected, but it doesn't hurt us to make an attempt for that because we need good people here doing the things that you're doing. And we need uh, more people like you and others from around the world, right? And we would hope uh, other countries would feel the same way towards us. Wow, so good. Okay, there I, I I took my uncomfortable step in asking that question. Well, let's go to our emojis to summarize the episode. So what we're gonna do, Ron, is we'll kind of like talk about either what we we will summarize or we'll think of the future. Yeah, the arena of what we talked about. Okay, so from your vantage point, what is the worst idea, the most blasphemous, the most far-fetched from God uh, that you can think of? Well, the worst one I can think of is when we think it's all about me or all about you. That if you read Screw Tape Letters with by C.S. Lewis, which everybody needs to read, it's how we trick ourselves. And and you remember. Well, God is made in man is made in God's image. Okay. Man is also furthest from God because all of the things that Satan wants to do to us are, are within the flesh that God gave us. And so that's the, that's the whole deal, the separation point that we struggle with all the time. And so when we focus totally that it's all about us, right? I remember, I remember I say in the book that one thing I had to learn that there is a God and it's not me right then that's where i think the most blasphemous that we as individuals can get so good a skeptical emoji where do you see skepticism played out or why are you skeptical off i think where i see skeptic skepticism played out and i'm guilty of this as well is is saying that boy things are really bad right now whatever it is whether it's economically or whether it's in the country uh, and there certainly are some things in, a, in a, uh, uh, the social warfare we're going through, culture warfare we're going through, and I get so skeptical that it can't change. But all I need to do is be a student of history, you know, and realize that there have been times in the past where if Ron Simmons lived back in the past, I would have said the same thing. Can you imagine what we thought about as we were going through our civil war or, or, or what was was going on even in Mexico when the uh, when the explorers were coming in, killing thousands of uh, native Mexicans and things like that. I mean, we would have thought it can't get ever get better than this. And yet things go through cycles if man looks to God. Mm. I love that. So inspiration to summarize what inspires you? Where do you see hope? Well, what inspires me is that I see people like you. I see people like uh, what Ali Beth is doing, other people like that, that regardless of what the world says, they're going to still speak truth. And speak truth is all speaking truth is always inspirational. Awesome. 
one to the last is the holy emoji. So from your vantage point, what is a holy idea? I think a holy idea is what is what we're taught, and that is love thy neighbor. Mm. Love thy neighbor. Now, that doesn't mean we agree with thy neighbor on everything. It doesn't mean we let the neighbor, you know, come in and uh, vandalize our home or anything like that. And, and that's metaphorically speaking. But we should love our neighbor. All right. Yeah. And loving our neighbor sometimes means telling our neighbor the truth. Mm. So good. And lastly, a divine idea. What is the highest idea you can think of, Ron? I think the highest idea that I could think of is the legacy and the inheritance, whether that's physical or whether that's uh, what you've taught them, that we leave our children and grandchildren, because that will have an impact far beyond mine or your life. Ron, that was phenomenal. I'm going to remove my glasses because right. I shed a tear in this episode. Oh. When you talk about the holy idea and the divine idea, I was so good, Ron. I mean, props to you. Props to what God Thank is you. still doing in your life and this book. Where can people find people? More? Yeah, yeah. You can get, <laughs> first, you can go to you can go to ronsimmons.com, which is my website. Or, of course, you can go on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, get their <laughs> listeners to books. They can go to Audible. And uh, they can reach me at Ron at RonSimmons.com. Happy to happy to have conversations with anybody that wants to reach out. And I appreciate you be, having me on very much. Thank you, Ron. This was this was amazing. This is a, a dream come true that I didn't even know I needed. This is so. Uh, good. And well, let's stay friends, in touch. Thank you for being here on the show. Thank you for watching. You know you can visit us at ChristianPodcast.com. Like, subscribe, share this episode. Rate it with a positive review. Five and up stars only. Right, right. I'll see you Absolutely. guys on the next one. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Take care. Okay.